Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd, the show where I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing Zero Escape, 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and we finished going through the 7 door and we talked a bit with Clover, we gave her the 4 Leaf Clover bookmark and things seem like they're going to be a bit brighter this time around because Clover's spirits have definitely been raised. She still has a bit of pessimism in her because... Well, she thinks her brother is dead, but hopefully that'll all resolve soon. Alright, so we're returning here. Uh, I know it'll take slightly more time, but I'm just going to choose the funny elevator option. It doesn't change anything at all, but it'll just make me happy knowing that on our true route, I chose the, the I might get wet option. Being locked up alone with a boy. I'm going to be skipping through a bunch of this because, you know, it's a lot of dialogue and I genuinely don't think I have any, like, funny commentary or just anything in general to say during this. If I do come up with something to say, I'll be sure to let you know, but... Door 1. Alright, the chart room. Now we've got to go ahead and speed run our way through this. Uh... And hopefully, Clover will be a bit more cooperative this time. Uh, just because, remember last time, she didn't really say much. Hold on, let me go back. One thing that I didn't know even existed until I watched a Let's Play of this game recently, is you can click on their shelves lined with books. Let's see what's in this blue one. Something written on it. Ship log. Huh, ship's log, huh? I d had no idea that this book even existed. But there it is, and I had no idea it existed because the information in it is pointless. We already got this information from the uh, from the nautical charts, so why does this book even exist? Uh, yeah, it's just the directions. Anyways, we open up, get the stopwatch. Oh, I just thought I'd come and check up on the two of you. Is there a problem? Yeah, there is. Aces, I... Ugh, Ace's eyebrows went up. You checked on us, now get out of here! We split this stuff up for a reason, alright? It was a lie. There was no reason to split up the work. Junpei wanted to talk to Clover privately. That was why he'd sent Ace to the wheelhouse. There was something he meant to ask Clover, but he didn't want anyone else to hear him ask it. He also knew that Clover would likely remain silent if there was anyone else around when he asked. That was why he was so desperate to send Ace back to the wheelhouse. He opened his mouth and took another look at Junpei and shut it again. And, yeah, Ace thinks some weird stuff. Phew. Junpei let out a sigh and brushed a few drops of sweat from his forehead. He turned and found himself looking straight into Clover's eyes. She'd heard what Ace had said. She regarded Junpei with caution. What was that about? It was, she was clearly suspicious and with good reason. Junpei's eyes widened and he held up his hands in a gesture of innocence. Oh, no, 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 it's not like that. What's it like, then? I just wanted to hear the rest of that story. I didn't want to, I didn't get a chance to ask you about it until now. What story? About the experiment. Remember? The one you started to tell me about in the operating room? You said something about an experiment that happened here nine years ago. Clover bit her lip. She stared down at the floor for several long moments, and when she spoke, it was barely audible. I'm sorry, but... I don't want to talk about that right now. I'm just not in the mood, okay? You understand, right? I'm just... I, can't, I keep thinking about my brother. I, I can't stop. I mean, who would do something like that? To my brother? I can't forgive them. I'm not going to let them get away with it. They're going to pay for it, I promise. So... So... Her shoulders were shaking, and drops of blood had sprung up on her lips where she was biting them. She wiped it off and looked up at Junpei, her eyes fierce and angry. Junpei? Who do you think did it? Her voice was cold and scarcely above a whisper. Junpei gulped. Well, if what Seven said was right, then there would have been at least two of them. You need at least three people to open the numbered doors, and if you subtract Snake, that means there were at least two other people. You're right. So what does that mean? Well, if we just look at the bracelet numbers, we should be able to figure it out. 
Who could have opened door three with Snake? Well, really, who and who, or who, who, and who? You mean it could have been four people? Well, technically it's possible. Um, I don't know. That doesn't seem very likely. Why? Hmm, I'll tell you later. Why don't we just assume it was only two other people for now? Uh, okay, got it. Let's do that then. And who do you think it could be? Junpei crossed his arms and thought. Snake's bracelet was number two. Which two bracelet numbers added to two would give a digital root of three? That would be... Would it be Santa and seven? Two plus three plus seven equals twelve. One plus two equals three. Three! Could it be? Were Santa and seven the killers? What's wrong? Clover looked at Junpei and he looked back at her. There was no point in hiding it. He told her his conclusions. That's what I thought. She looked less surprised than he'd expected. Santa and Seven. If it was two people, then that's the only combination that works. Hey, wait a minute there. Don't you think it's a little too early to be jumping to conclusions? Well, all I said is that those two would have been able to open door three with your brother. There still might be other possibilities. Well, what other possibilities? Uh, um... He didn't have an answer. He was ready to admit defeat when Clover spoke. Are you saying that you think it was three or four people? I really don't think that's likely. Can I borrow your pen and paper? Clover put her hand out expectantly. Junpei pulled out his pen and pad of paper and handed them to her. She opened the notebook and wrote down several simple addition problems. Eventually, she had eight, which provided a digital root of three. A. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 6 equals 12. B. 2 plus 1 plus 4 plus 5 equals 12. C. 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 8 equals 12. Or 21. D. 2 plus 5 plus 6 plus 8 equals 21. E. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 7 plus 8 equals 21. 2. Or F. 2 plus 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 equals 21. G. 2 plus 1 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 equals 21. H. 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 7 equals 21. What's this? And these are the combinations for three or four people. These eight combinations are the only possible ones. I see. Junpei? Yeah? I... I can trust you, right? Of course. Why would you need to ask that? Really? Yeah. So then I should get rid of B, D, G, and H, right? Of course. Just cross them out. You should take off yours, too. The ones with four. So, so what does that leave? A and D. A, 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 6 equals 12. E, 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 7 equals plus 8 equals 21. Wait, it can't be A. Why not? Because June's in that one. There's no way in hell she'd do something like that. Are you sure? I bet my life on it. Okay then, then I can cross off A2, right? Yeah. Well, what have we got left? E. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 7 plus 8 equals 21. Do you know what this means? Everyone besides me, you, and June would be working together. Do you think that's likely? Hmm. If there were four people working together, they wouldn't be very cautious. I don't think they'd try that hard to hide what they were doing if they outnumbered us, right? Well, you do have a point. And besides, if Ace and Seven are working together, they could have easily gotten rid of me when I went to the shower room with them. But they didn't. They didn't even try anything. If they were the killers, why wouldn't they? Her voice was calm, but Junpei only had to look in her eye to know it was a forced calm. There were tears forming at the corners of her eyes, and she was blinking furiously to keep them back. Perhaps by attempting an objective analysis of who might have killed her brother, she had been able to distance herself from the harsh reality of his death. The more she struggled to act on concern, the more Junpei felt his heart tighten. Okay. Yeah, well that does make sense. It does seem pretty unlikely that it was as many as three or four people. Yeah. And that means there's a good chance it was Santa and Seven. That's how it looks. But then why would they do it? There was a moment of silence. 
I, I think I know. What is it? He laid his hand gently on his shoulder. He was close. So close to the answer. Hunes chose the worst possible moment to return. He raised a knowing eyebrow and then spoke. Have I interrupted something? What do you want? There was something I wanted to speak with you about, Junpei. Could you come with me for a moment? He turned on his heel and walked back toward the wheelhouse. Junpei looked over at Clover. He gave her a short nod, hoped that she would be willing to talk to him again later, and followed Ace. What did you want to talk about? Ace looked at Junpei and smiled. Perhaps more of a smirk than a smile. There was something I wanted to check. Yeah, what's that? If you'll excuse me. No warning, he slipped his hand into the pocket of Junpei's vest. Hey, what the hell are you doing? He reached for Ace's arm. But it was already too late. In the older man's hand were the pieces of paper Junpei had balled up and hidden in his pocket. Just as I thought. You switched them, didn't you? When we voted. Ah, well, I can't say that I care. I managed to get through the numbered door I wanted, despite your mischief. When... why did you... Oh, simply curiosity. I hoped you won't think ill of me for it. A smiled, gave Junpei a friendly pat on the shoulder, and then turned on his heel and left. It was a small defeat, but it was a defeat. Junpei had lost the upper hand, and he knew it. He could feel his stomach begin to tense. We were so dang close. God dang it, Ace. No matter what playthrough we're in, Ace screws us over every time. Get back to the captain's quarters. Just in, t just in time to see that the captain is dead once again. There's the axe from the axe ending. And the bracelet from pretty much every ending. But now, the, now we know that that's a six. So, whatever's going on here is pretty strange. Well, even if he wasn't one of us, there's no way that man could be zero. Don't you get it? The letters that spell zero on the TV screen, the captain's clothes he's got on, and of course, the bracelet with the zero on it. It's too obvious. Look, look, there's a zero right here. This dead body is zero. Doesn't that sound, kind of seem funny to you? You're right. Only an idiot wouldn't see through something like that. No, that's not the point. I'm not trying to make fun of them for thinking a trick like this would work. I'm sure they didn't think it would work. Which makes me wonder why did they do it. I think this is a challenge. A challenge from the person who's really behind all of this. It's making fun of us. Don't you get it? If whoever killed the guy really wanted us to think this corpse was zero, they'd never have put a bracelet on him. Walking around with a zero bracelet would be like hanging a sign around your neck that said, I did it! Anyone with a brain would be able to see this guy that is supposed to look like everything zero is supposed to be, just like we did. The killer must have known he wouldn't think he was zero, and put the bracelet on him anyway. Do you know why? Why? Like I said, he's mocking us. Too bad, suckers. This isn't zero. It's the same bad joke a lot of criminals like to play. They'll just sit back and watch people run in circles. Look, here I am. What's wrong, guys? Come on, catch me if you can. It's really twisted, but it almost seems like kind of childish. Yeah, you're right. It's really childish. It's like a game to whoever the, this person is. That's what seems funny to me. Junpei bent down next to the corpse. All right, let's get back to the point. Who killed this man? I don't know. And what's this guy's deal? Who is he? How would I know that? If I knew anything, I would have told you. You have no idea who he is? Why would I? Hmm. Junpei sat back on his haunches and thought. We should check to see if he's got anything on him that might tell us who he is. Give me a hand here, Clover. What? Well, we've got to flip him over. How else are we going to search his pockets? Clover didn't move. Junpei had no choice but to move the body on his own. He grabbed hold of, the, of an area not completely covered in blood and shoved. It took a moment, but eventually Junpei felt the man's bulk begin to shift. But just as it did, something fell. 
from the man's left wrist. The bracelet with a zero on the face. And lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship or detects that it's where his heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. Junpei stared at the bracelet. This man, he's dead, isn't he? Huh? No, it's just, I, I guess I didn't really think about it until right now. This bracelet's off, that means he's dead. Well, it's pretty obvious that he's dead. You don't really need to ha have a look at his bracelet to figure that out. Yeah, I guess you're right. It is pretty obvious. It looks a lot better than the other bodies we've seen, though, you know? I mean, if there wasn't all this blood, he'd almost look like he was still alive. I mean, I know it's kind of mess a messed up thing to say, but kind of has it better, you know? Dying from a bomb going off inside you, I mean, that's just... Some snake's bones went right through his skin. I think the explosion must have thrown him against a wall or something. This broken bone is sticking out, out of his left arm. Suddenly, Junpei realized what he was saying. How could he have been so cruel? He clapped his hands over his mouth. But it was already too late. He turned to look at Clover. She was glaring at him furiously. What did you just say? Her words sounded cold. He knew an apology could hardly atone for what he'd done, but he tried anyway. Oh man, I... I'm, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I really don't know what I was thinking. I mean... No! That's not what I'm talking about! What did you say about his arm? Uh, arm? Yes, his left arm! You said it, didn't you? Well, yeah, I did, but... I mean, didn't you see it too? Of course not! I could barely look at him! Clover took a quick, deep breath. Are you sure it was his left arm? Junpei thought back. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. And he had a broken bone, right? What the hell are you getting at here? Just shut up and answer me! She shoved her face close to his. He could see the fire in her eyes. Junpei winced and swallowed. Yeah, he did. It was pretty bad, too. The bone was sticking out of his arm. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than Clover's expression changed. Suddenly, she was crying. Junpei wasn't sure what to do. Thank you. It was close to the last thing he had expected to hear. Junpei had no idea what just happened. He didn't think he'd done anything worthy of thanks, and he couldn't understand why she would have chosen that moment to begin crying. So he simply stood there, confused. Thank you, Junpei. She thanked him again, and then something even stranger happened. Clover threw herself into Junpei's surprised arms. Hey, what's going on with you? I'm sorry, it's just... I'm so happy. Why? The body in the shower room. It... it isn't his. It isn't my brother. Huh? It's not Snake. Why on earth would you think that? Because his left arm is... She stopped herself. I'm sorry. I really shouldn't be talking about this. Junpei decided it would be prudent not to press her for any more information. If she did not wish to tell him, she certainly had a reason for doing so. Perhaps more importantly, however, if Clover was so certain, then she was likely right. That meant that the body in the shower room wasn't Snake. It wasn't much, but that knowledge lifted some of the weight from Junpei's heart. He's still alive! I'm... I'm so happy! Tears shone in her eyes. Those tears melted Junpei's heart. As she cried, she pushed herself up against his chest like a child. Junpei put his arms around her and held her tight. Junpei, you were right! No matter what happens, you can never lose hope! You have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith, and to have love. If you can remember all those, that'll bring you good luck. Clover reached into her pocket and pulled something out. It was a laminated bookmark with a four-leaf clover. I... I only made it here because you gave me this. I was suspicious of everybody, and I was angry and miserable. But because I had this four-leaf clover, because of what you said to me, I... Junpei hadn't thought his words would have had such an effect on her. Her words were making him feel a little awkward. 
Thank you so much, Junpei. She looked up at him. He scratched his nose and pretended to notice something interesting somewhere else in the room. If you really want to thank somebody, you, sh you should be thanking Santa. Santa? Why? Well, he was the one who gave me that thing. And the words for each leaf? Got that from him, too. And then suddenly... Clover broke away from Junpei. Huh? He looked confused. He hadn't thought she'd react that poorly. Clover began to pace across the room. Six steps to the left. Six steps to the right. Another six to the left. And then she stopped. Did... Did Santa really tell you those things? Her eyes were serious, but not angry. Y yeah he did. Did I, uh, say something wrong? Oh no, not at all. In fact, this could be really good news. I think. You think? Santa knew about the words in the clover? The only people who should know about that are other subjects. Subjects? The other people who were in the experiment nine years ago with my brother and me. But he's blind, and I was part of the Nevada test group, so neither of us would be able to recognize the faces of the people who were on this boat. Whoa, 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 whoa! Time out! Junpei held up his hands. He took a deep breath and let it out. Let's just... Calm down for a second, okay? Start from the top. Don't start with the end and then jump to the middle. You gotta start at one and then move to two and three and four and so on. If you don't tell me the stuff in the right order, I'm never gonna be able to figure it out. Clover nodded. Alright, let's start with this experiment. What happened on this boat nine years ago? Do you know about morphogenetic fields? He did, and the realization sent chills down Junpei's spine. Alright, how about this? Theory of the telepathic mechanism. Junpei recounted what Lotus had told him earlier. Clover nodded. Hmm, telepathy, huh? Well, that's not really it, but I suppose it's similar. So they were testing telepathy on this ship? Yeah, I guess so. So what exactly did they, did they have you guys do? The same thing they were doing now. Exactly the same thing. What? The nonary game. Nine people were put on this boat and nine others went to the building in Nevada. And the game started. Junpei grabbed the sides of his head. Look, I'm sorry, but I don't get it. What did the nonary game and some telepathy experiment have to do with each other? Clover bit her lip. She blinked back sudden tears. What had happened to her in Nevada? The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. You know how sometimes when you're up against a really tough problem, and then the answer just kind of pops into your head? That's an epiphany! And what you learn from that epiphany can be transmitted with telepathy. And when you add danger to that equation, then it gets easier to transmit that information over telepathy. So you're saying the Nonary game was supposed to introduce that element of danger? Yeah, but it couldn't be just any old danger. It had to be life and death. And, and, someone did actually die. A girl. Junpei felt a sudden grip of despair on his heart. Something deep and distant and powerful squeezed, and for a moment he felt very, very empty and alone. She was on the boat with my brother. I was in Nevada, so I never met her, but I did hear her name. Her name was, um... And the sound of the door opening was like a gunshot. Junpei spun around. Oh, my apologies. It, I seem to have disturbed you. Ace. You two must have strong stomachs. I can't imagine how you could stay in this room for so long. Ace glanced down at the floor. At the corpse covered in blood. At any rate, Junpei, would you be so kind as to come help me with something? I'm having a little trouble and I could really use your assistance. Come on, it'll only take a moment. With that, he turned and walked back toward the communications office. Clover waited until he was out of sight and then spoke in a small, quiet voice. I don't want Ace to hear us. We can talk about this later. Huh? Hey, wait! Clover ignored him. From outside, Junpei could hear Ace calling. Junpei, what are you doing in there? Hurry up! Ah! 
Grumbling to himself, Junpei stomped off toward the communications office. And now we got the got to solve the puzzle again. So we're, thank you, Ace. A chair. It's a chair. If I sit in it, will you let me be chairman? No. Oh. Okay, that was kind of funny. Now here's an interesting part. This is what I was talking about previously. How we've heard all ice before. This file with all of the. Uh, ancient uh, hieroglyphs in it said all ice on it all ice Alice that mean Junpei couldn't hold back he had to know what was in that file and the hieroglyphs once more so that's cool if you uh, go through without learning about Alice then you oh some more extra dialogue. I was just going to say that that was a slight dialogue change, but no, there's some extra stuff here. This must be a key to the library on the bottom deck. So it would seem. The bottom deck. The library. Junpei remembered something he'd heard from Seven when they'd been in the chemical closet. Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the force of knowledge, beneath the navel of the gigantic. Did beneath the navel mean the bottom deck? Did Forest of Knowledge mean the library? If it did, then was Alice in a room somewhere beyond the library? What's wrong? Junpei blinked. Only then did he notice Ace looking at him, curiosity and concern written across his face in equal parts. There's no reason for Junpei to hide his thoughts. He began to explain his theory to Ace. Then he stopped. Wouldn't make any sense if Ace didn't know who Alice was supposed to be. So he told Ace everything Juno told him. About the Egyptian priestess, about Ice Nine, and finally about the woman who wouldn't melt if it melt who had been recovered from the Titanic disaster. He told him about how she had been called All Ice, which eventually turned into Alice, and how she had been purchased by an English millionaire who called himself Lord Gordain, and how Gordain had hid Alice somewhere on the ship. And you think he had hid her in a small room beyond the library on the bottom deck? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess so. There are a couple of lines that I've noticed that seem like they're supposed to be narration, but they're character lines instead. I don't know if that's, like, something, like, weird with this game or whatever. You see. He stared off into the distance, his hand slowly and absentmindedly stroking his beard. After a few moments, he, his hand stopped. He turned slowly to look at Junpei, and his brows drew together. Junpei. Have you ever heard of the term CAS? CAS? It stands for Cells Alive System. It is an advanced technology for freezing and preserving organic matter. But simply, it is a technique that allows one to freeze things without the formation of ice crystals. Normally, if you freeze something fresh, water within its cells expands as it crystallizes, damaging the cell membrane. CAS, however, works differently. The object to be frozen is supercooled using magnetic fields and then frozen instantly and uniformly, giving ice crystals no time to form. It was originally developed for the preservation of food as an alternative to the normal freezing process. Now, however, there are rumors that it can be used for... other things. What do you mean, other things? Well, there are obviously medical use- there are obvious medical uses, but perhaps also... space travel. Space travel? Are you serious? Surely you've heard of suspended animation. Cryogenic freezing. It's a fairly common idea in science fiction books and films. People are sometimes frozen for especially lengthy journeys through space. That was when Junpei understood what Ace was suggesting. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute there. Ace looked at him and raised an eyebrow. Are you saying that Alice was frozen using that cast thing? Well, I'm sure the possibility is quite low, but it is a possibility. If the special ice you call Ice 9 does indeed exist, and if Cass were used to freeze her into that sort of ice instantaneously. Think she could be alive? Well, I can't say for sure, of course. I'm only talking about possibilities. The melting point for Ice 9 is 96 degrees, right? If she were put somewhere where she could reach that temperature. That's nuts! Are you really saying she could have defrosted instead of walking around? You are quite right. It does sound unbelievable. But if she had, then we would have an explanation for the man we found dead on the floor. 
You mean the guy dressed like a captain? Yes. He was dead when we found him. Clearly, he was murdered. But if he was murdered, then by who? It couldn't have been one of us. That would be impossible. In order to enter the captain's quarters, one must first open door one. That door that requires the earth key prevented us from accessing door one. Who was it that opened the door? Santa and Lotus. Right. Clearly, the two of them could not have opened door one or any other door for that matter. Who else then could have done so? Junpei thought for a second. No, nobody. After Santa and Lotus had used the Earth Key, they turned back and met up with Junpei and Jun, who had just returned from Edek. The four of them then proceeded to return to the large hospital room to reunite with Ace, Seven, and Clover. When Junpei and his team had gone into the shower room, Ace, Seven, and Clover had been left in the large hospital room, but they would have been unable to open door one. Perhaps when Junpei and Jun had taken the elevator to door two then? No, they would that would have been impossible. They had been gone for only five minutes. No human being could have run to the captain's quarters, killed the man in there, and then run back in five minutes. It would be impossible for any of us to be the murderer. That being the case, who could have killed him? Wouldn't it make sense if his killer was someone who had been in the ship for some time? A person like that would know the ship well. They would know the locations of all the hidden passages and secret doors. The numbered doors would mean nothing to someone like that. It would be a simple thing for them to enter the captain's quarters. Then you're saying the killer was Alice? It was Junpei's turn to raise an eyebrow. Ace drew his thumb across his lips thoughtfully. Well, this is all only one possible theory. All ice. Alice. Was Alice indeed somewhere on the ship with them? Junpei had only one clue. The key card in his hand. It would, he hoped, grant him access to the Force of Knowledge. But beyond that, what waited for him beyond the Force of Knowledge? Whatever might be there, however, would have to wait. That moment, there was nothing Junpei could do. He gripped the key card tighter and shoved it deep into his pocket. And with that, we have learned a bit more about Alice. Uh, so it's possible that she could still be alive, walking around the ship somewhere, just doing something. So, we're gonna keep that possibility in mind for now. It may be true, it may be not. Whatever happens. I messed that up. Whatever happens, just always remember to keep all of these different possibilities in mind. Anyways, with that, we are going to end off this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!